JEA continues serving the people of Northeast Florida, and what's happening in the background continues confounding people on both sides of the issue. The tension surrounds the so-called invitation to negotiate and possible privatization. Former Mayor Tommy Hazuri weighs in and takes a position as current city council member. We know football is big in Florida and Northeast Florida, but not big enough for Jacksonville University anymore. The surprise announcement came this week, no more Dolphins football. School President Tim Cost joins us with the why and what next for JU, all on This Week in Jacksonville. Thanks for joining us. We're also speaking with State Representative Jason Fisher a little later in our show. Right now, though, uh, it was out of the blue to most people, but not all. Jacksonville University's Division I football program will be no more. Joining us in studio, President Tim Koss. And we reported this uh, this week that that decision comes after more than a year of examination by uh, what the school described as a data-driven evaluation of Division I intercollegiate athletics. So maybe explain uh, how this was arrived at, this decision. Great. Thanks for having me on. First of all, we're a university. We deliver education. Uh, we also happen to play football. Uh, we play 20 Division I sports at our university, 19 are NCAA Division I, which includes full scholarships, and one, football, is non-scholarship. So we are one of only a dozen schools in America that play non-scholarship football. What we talked about earlier this week was that we were going to take an entire look at the strategy around athletics at the university, which is 550 student athletes, and the strategy of the entire university. We're in the middle of both. As we worked our way through it with outside consultants and a lot of top people who are helping us look at the pros and cons of what we play, where we play, the technology we use, what conference, you know, how often, how many, we came down to take a hard look at football. And we made a decision to offer the 95 returning football players full tuition scholarships, fret rising sophomores, juniors, and seniors through to graduation, which no school in NCAA history has ever done. 62 universities at Division I have canceled football. We're now one of them. We're now 63. None of them have ever done this. And we made good on every one of the nine fully paid uh, assistant coaches, and we made good on the multiple years left on the head coach's contract. So to us, it's about the students, these young men, and helping them become college graduates. Yeah, I, I know you mentioned to our reporter as they spoke this week that... Uh, it's not all about the finances, but it's about a bigger picture for JU. But it seems like financially, football has to be, uh, a program has to be a risk if you're not in the SEC or the Big Ten or, or one of those big conferences. Is that right? Exactly right. So there's 125 what they call FCS schools. That's what the level we play at. Of the 125, the NCAA two years ago put out a report that said 122 of them lose money. That's 98%. That includes us. There's no money being made in football at the level we play. The average loss for each one of those 122 schools was $2.4 million a year. I have said it's a multi-million dollar a year investment for us to play college football, and that's true. Okay, so I'm just letting that settle in. That's a big number when you're talking about more than $2 million on average that, that schools are going to invest, as you yeah, put it. sure. And I, and I just to remind you, I mean, we love these young men. I mean, these, these guys are part of the family of Jacksonville University, and I hope every one of them, I know there's some very, very fine players there. They're going to get a chance to go into the transfer portal and move on and play elsewhere. We've put an entire care team together of student academic advising, how to handle the portal, what do you do with financial aid, how do you register for new classes. That entire group of professionals was available the moment those athletes walked out of the meeting Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. They were there to help. And I think that's been a positive thing. Families have feelings, players have yeah. feelings, but in the main, it's been quite stunning to us to see people showing support for a student-centered approach to whether or not you should play certain sports. Yeah, I know your personal connection to JU was because of sports recruited from New York to the Sunshine State to play baseball at JU. Yeah. Um, since sports brought you to JU, this had to be a tough decision, um, at least on the personal side for you. And I guess I was going to ask, would you have made the same decision if it was coming down to, hey, we should get rid of the baseball program since that was so important to you? Yeah, I mean. It I think the degree to which people think this is about football, they're missing the point about the decision-making we went through. Certainly the athletic director and the, ac and the work he was doing 
uh, was focused on his 20 sports. When you talk about academics, we're talking about the 70 plus majors. When you talk about student affairs, you talk about the 125 student organizations. We're doing strategic work around all of those. So yes, it was Division I athletics that got me here, no question. Both my kids were Division I athletes. My son ended up being a pro athlete. This was a difficult and complicated decision. We worked hard on this and we kept putting in the middle of it how do you protect the opportunity for these young men to become college graduates? There are some football players there, and they're going to go on and play elsewhere, we know. But if, if you want to graduate from this university, you now have a $40,000 per year full tuition scholarship, and we don't do that. So what has the response been? I know we're just a few days away from when that announcement was made. And I, and I heard from people on campus, that, you know, frustration. You expected that because it was a surprise for these dedicated athletes and, hey, what am I going to do? But how many of the folks have said, yeah, I'm going to take you up, J.U., I'm going to take you up on that full tuition, or I'm going to try and play football somewhere else? Sure. So it's early days. You're right. Yeah. It's a, this is less than a week into when it happened. So of the 95, there's 102 players on the team. Seven will graduate this coming April. That's 95 returnees. Of that 95, as of midweek, 30 had gone into what they call the NCAA portal, and in football, you can identify yourself and say, I'd like to explore leaving. That's called a transfer portal, but you don't have to leave. So the real answer to your question is we don't know. There's some number less than 95 that we think are going to come back, and we're prepared to welcome them all back. One of the things that I heard uh, early on, and I think it was a emotion, you know, speaking, but there was some criticism. Hey, why didn't you tell the football players? And in your interview with our reporter, I know you said, hey, we wanted to make sure that the athletic director had that chance to address those athletes. Was there any way to make it as smooth as, you know, any way to avoid some of those criticisms? Because it was just going to be, it was going to hurt uh, the surprise and the shock and everything anyway, right? Sure, yeah, so let me talk about that, because your reporter is the only one who asked that question, but it's a fair question. At the very moment, 9 o'clock a.m. on the morning of December the 3rd, we had the assistant coaches being spoken to by the head of compliance and the head of communications. Exactly 9 o'clock, the athletic director's talking to the players. And at exactly 9 o'clock, the president of the university is meeting with the head coach. He's a friend of mine. I hired him. Ian Shields is an outstanding guy. First class professional. Everything we thought he'd be. Highest character. And I thought I owed him the respect sure. of him not getting it via email or phone call. Right. I reached him the night before to set it up. We worked very hard on the timing. You know, this is the first, the day we, we did this, this was the first business day after their last football game. So we were trying to give these young, rather than call them back onto campus, they'd all gone home for Thanksgiving. And we brought them back. And when they came back to school, we made the announcement. You give them now from December to next August to decide if they want to join us or join elsewhere. We really worked hard on the timing. And so I think we showed everybody respect. How does uh, this decision with the football program in this case impact the broader vision for what's going on at JU? Right, sure. Anytime you take something where you've spent this much of your resource availability on one thing, you open up opportunities elsewhere. I think we've, you've been nice enough to have me on before. Where we've talked about all the growth in the health sciences and the business school and the STEAM center and what's going on with the other sports and the fine arts. You know, this right, right now, you've got a growing university of 4,300 students with four colleges and five schools and two institutes. And at this moment, you're taking a multi-million dollar investment that was all targeted toward 100 young men. And you're going to be able to move that around into some of the other areas. Academics is going to get a big portion of this, and the faculty understand that, trust me. And some of the other sports are going to do this as well. All right. Well, I know it's a hard week, but uh, and big news at the time. But appreciate uh, taking the time to explain where it came from and what you're hoping to accomplish. Thanks for hearing us out. I think yeah. the students understand. Thanks, President. Good. Cost. Thank you. All right. Well, stay with us. A JU graduate is our next guest, by the way. Currently a city council member, Tommy Hazuri, also a former mayor in the River City. He enjoins us with his opinions on the controversy with JEA. That's next on This Week in Jacksonville. Ford F-150, built for the holidays. Get 20% estimated savings on the 2019 Ford F-150 during the Built for the Holidays sales event. We weren't happy with our bathtub. But we didn't want the headaches of demolition. Or the days without our bathroom. Then a friend told us about Bath Fitter and their unique tub over tub process. There's no demolition and they install in as little as a day. They also have a seamless wall for a watertight fit. 
and Bath Fitter has a lifetime guarantee. What a difference. Finally, a bathtub I love. So I went to Lowe's and got some shelves. Doing it right runs in the family. So Lowe's has hardworking brands like DeWalt, Cobalt, and Craftsman. Because you can bring the holidays together, even if you're apart. Get your choice of Craftsman Power Tool Kit or Air Compressor for $99. Do it right for less. Start with Lowe's. Our members shop a little differently. So we reward every purchase. Let's see what Kate's in. For you. For all of us. That's for me. Navy Federal Credit Union. Our members are the mission. You got ripped. Thanks. Off. You got ripped off. Whoever sold you those glasses charged you too much. <sighs> I'd be red-faced, too. Next time, go to America's Best, where two pairs and a free exam are just $69.95. It's not just a better deal. It's America's Best. The old saying, shop till you drop, takes on a whole new meaning when you've fallen and injured yourself in a place of business. The fact is, businesses have the responsibility to keep their premises safe for shoppers. If you've been hurt at a business, it's important you contact Farrah and Farrah right away. Accident scenes can change. Witnesses can vanish. Evidence can be lost. When you fall down, we stand up. Farrah and Farrah. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but could it be a Ranger with Ford Copilot 360 technology and lightning blue? Get 20% estimated savings on the 2019 Ford Ranger during the Built for the Holidays sales event. Thank you for once again making News 4 Jacks your number one local station. The I-Team warned parents about a popular over-the-counter herb with lethal consequences. We showed you the local stores selling the most winning lottery tickets. And got results for families fighting for renters' rights. News for Jacks number one all morning long. And number one at 5, 5.30, 6 o'clock, and your number one choice at night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. A couple weeks ago, a former mayor spoke out against the process for exploring a sale of JEA. That former mayor was Jake Godbold. In the room at City Hall that day, the man who succeeded Godbold as mayor of Jacksonville, Tommy Hazuri, now a city councilman and the vice president of city council, Mr. Hazuri, is uh, joining us right now. Let's Thank start you. with your reaction to, uh, I guess, the process that JEA is going through. Do you agree with what's happening here? The process should be pure, but it's not. it hasn't been. And I think that's been the difficulty with the city council and the JEA, notwithstanding the mayor's position one way or the other. Um, some would think that the city council has nothing to do with it. But quite frankly, the buck stops with us. We're the policy makers, we're the legislative body, and we're the ones who decide how much money is spent and where. Um, it's been difficult to follow that process, and I'm on that... Um, I attend the workshops that we have every week, all the way through May, we're going to be having them. But, you know, and I use this phrase all the time, I said, it's like Columbo, one more thing. You know, you think you're there, and then they pop up with, for example, the last little bit was the um, performance pay. Unit performance and pay. that will be gone, hopefully, by December 17th meeting. Should never have happened. And, um, and so it's difficult when you're having a Waccama and you're trying to deal with their process and at the same time some of these issues that pop up that uh, divert you from what you're trying to do and that's concentrate now between now and the time they come forward with whatever recommendation they come to the council and, uh, and trying to address those issues and they're throwing out everything that we have to go back and, and try to undo. It, it gets complex. It's an clearly. unmagnificent obsession to me. Mm. You know, the mayor brought it up two years ago, and uh, it hasn't really stopped since then. And the problem has been the citizens, the rank-and-file voters, the ratepayers. They don't want to sell the JEA. Okay. I was going to say, you don't mean they're the problem. You're no. saying that the problem is no. they don't If I've gotten us. any calls in all the years I've been in public service, and I don't just go by the emails. We didn't have emails way back when. But um, if I went by all the calls I got, and the street people, as I call them, that come up to me at Panera's, my hangout in Mandarin, sure. or elsewhere, 
it's don't sell the JEA. I think it's a comfort factor. It's been there, you know, it's, as they said in The Godfather, it's bigger than U.S. Steel. And it is a big, comforting company and business that's been doing well for Jacksonville, Florida. I think what's incumbent on us is to learn what can't they do that other companies may be able to do. If we can change the charter or we can change state legislation, why haven't they tried to present that instead of going sure. full force ahead? So as a former mayor, the biggest issue was bonuses back then, the oil prices. Today, uh, it's whether you sell or not. Yeah. The process now is come next spring or whenever they come forward with a recommendation, we vote it up or down. If we voted it up, whatever it might be, it goes to the public for a vote. I'm hoping that this thing can get resolved way sooner. Before that, yes. you know, your colleague Matt Carlucci fired off an email the day after Thanksgiving and uh, basically called on the board at JEA to fire the CEO or remove the CEO, Aaron Zahn. Is Zahn, in your opinion, not doing the job that he was hired to do? I'm not going to judge him. He's very arrogant, and I would say that to him. Uh, and I think he comes across that way. But it's not just the executive director or the president or the chairman. He's not the chairman, but, you know, you've got seven other members on the board. You can't just, and I, I appreciate what Matt's doing. Each individual councilman can say and do what they'd like to do, and I welcome that. But, you know, just to say you're going to, we want to fire this person because he may or may not be incompetent or competent, but you still have seven other board members that make that decision. And the mayor appoints them, and we as a council, to, the, to our fault, I mean, we approve them. Right. It goes through our rules committee, and then it goes to the council for approval. But uh, it goes beyond that. It's much deeper, I think. And um, I think where I didn't see as much concern among my colleagues before, I think that 19 to zero vote about the performance pay, the resolution we had, spoke volumes yeah. on what they did. And they need to know that they're not invisible, that they must be transparent, and transparency hadn't been their MO. One of the things I want, and maybe we wrap up here, but one of the things that you've referenced, in, and if you're not familiar, it came out a couple of weeks ago, JEA promised the board uh, that they were going to remove this uh, cash incentive plan. It was passed back in the summer, but didn't really fully come to light until just this last month of November. This was this thing where people participating could uh, invest a million dollars and at the end of that come out with $300 million or $600 million or even more than Quite that. Frankly, if, if it were sold and if it will save $3 billion, right? And that's Whatever the minimum. That net, million, yeah, the net, was. if it was based on that performance pay per yeah. 100 points, however, $10 a point, whatever the mechanism were, that yeah. they have, and by the way, I talk to our council auditor constantly. He is right on target. If you had 30% of the people uh, participating, it would be 300 and some odd million dollars. If you had the full 100%, it would be a billion dollars off of that 3 billion or off of that 4 billion or whatever it might be. It's inconceivable that they would even think that way, especially after in their proposal in their collective bargaining, uh, uh, presentation that we voted on, they will get all the employees, including the executives, the senior management, will get three over a three-year period twice their salary if it's sold. Yeah. All and of that sounds wrong to you, is what it seems like. It doesn't just sound wrong. I think what was missing, the missing piece, they should have come to the council and addressed the issue, what they would like to do. Uh, the question now is, does the council have the right to dissolve what they're doing or move forward. Um, I don't mind learning what the value is. Obviously, if you have nine people remaining, nine entities remaining saying they're interested, there must be something good about the JEA. I love the JEA. I grew up with the big gym going at 7, 5, 1, 12 in the afternoon and in the morning. I, uh, growing up downtown, I think it's a comfort factor. Sure. They're very accessible to the public. Lights go out. If, the, if we have a hurricane, Respond. you get FEMA support. There's a number of good reasons, and I've asked them to take everything that the JEA has done in their negotiations at the last workshop and tell us, can you match that and do better? And, you know, I'm not objecting to them looking at it, but uh, I think it's incumbent on them, to, and it should have been incumbent on them, to come to us instead of saying that they're going to do it separate from the council. Nothing happens unless the council ultimately approves it. Tommy Azuri, thank you so much for your Thank insights. you. Appreciate the time today. Thank you.
Mandarin State Representative Jason Fisher. He's with us next. So stand by on This Week in Jacksonville. We'll be right back. At Hertz, we know that a change of scenery shouldn't mean a change in standards. That's why, thanks to you, we're rated number one in customer satisfaction by J.D. Power. While I love to cook, I love when someone does the work for me. It's time to vote for Jack's Best. Head to newsforjacks.com slash Jack's Best to vote for the best meal prep company. Presented by Visit Jacksonville. And thank you, Jacksonville, for making your voice heard and picking these favorites. Want to see your favorite Channel 4 newscast when you're on the go? No problem. You can watch News 4 Jax live anytime, right on your desktop, phone, or tablet. Get clear viewing. Sponsored by the law offices of Jason Porter. I'm attorney Jason Porter, and I help people get the money they deserve when they've been injured in an accident. When you're hurt, put your trust in me. Your consultation is free, and unless we get money for you, you don't pay any legal fees. Injured? Pick Porter. Subaru of Jacksonville has made giving back to the community a priority. We've won the Subaru Love Promise Retailer of the Year, supported many causes, and even recognized as a top 10 partner in Jacksonville. So, of course, we find a way to go bigger during the Subaru Share the Love event. During the event, Subaru donates to charities with every new car purchase. Subaru of Jacksonville is matching that donation to equal $500, plus another $5 for every Subaru vehicle routine service visit. Visit Subaru of Jacksonville today. Drive a Subaru. You'll buy a Subaru. When you choose Florida Blue for a health plan, you get an entire community of care looking after your health and financial well-being. That's something different. Open enrollment is here. Get a plan that connects you to the health experts and resources that will help you be your healthiest at a price you can afford. Call 855-650-6803 for expert guidance from a Florida Blue agent. They'll provide you with savings tips determine if you're eligible for financial assistance, and help you find a plan that's different with premiums as low as $0 a month. Our plans offer care when and where you need it with an expanded doctor and hospital network and 24-7 virtual care. It's less hassle and more savings, convenience and care. That's something different. Call 855-650-6803 today to speak to a local agent who will help you explore affordable plan options and introduce you to our community of care. But hurry, because the deadline to enroll is December 15th. Save now at Travel Camp RV with payments as low as $107 a month and no payments for 90 days. It's fall fun season. Time to get out with family and friends in an RV from Travel Camp where you get the guaranteed lowest price every time. Travel Camp specializes in towables, which keeps the cost lower and the prices lower than all the rest. Choose from the best brands for as little as $107 a month with no payments for 90 days. Since 1982, we've helped more families make more great memories. Shop now and save at Travel Camp RV. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. And we're about a month away from the start of Florida's legislative session. I spoke this week with Florida House member Jason Fisher, representing Mandarin in District 16. The most talked about issue so far, Fisher's support of a measure to make the Duval County Schools superintendent elected. I firm, firmly believe, and I think the public is with me, right? UNF just did a poll and showed 70% of the people support having an elected superintendent. Um, that makes the superintendent more accountable directly to the constituents and the parents in our community. I think there are some elites in our society who think that they know better than everybody else and they want to be able to, to make that choice for the, uh, you know, they want to be able to, to take that choice. Um, but I think the voters are the ones who know what's best for our community. I think the voters are the ones who know what's best for our children and they should be able to pick the chief executive for our schools. And so that's why I think J1 is important. Now, your experience includes being on the school board in Duval County. Right. So did that influence how you feel about that? Uh, yeah, partially. So uh, I spent four years on the school board as elected back in, in 2012 or originally. And we did have an appointed superintendent. Uh, I still believe, I believed at the time, and I still believe that we should have had an elected superintendent. Uh, because again, I fundamentally trust the voters to make those decisions. When I was on the school board, I didn't have enough votes to be able to move forward with that uh, in a way that would have gotten on the ballot. Now that I'm in the legislature, uh, I'm not trying to make that decision for voters. I'm trying to empower them. I'm trying to make sure that every voice is heard on this and just let the voters decide on whether they want an elected superintendent or not. Again, I think, as the UNF poll shows, voters are with me on this one. So it would still go to voters about that before any change was made, is that correct? So the local bill, which 
still needs to pass in Tallahassee would come back to Duval County. Yeah. It would be a countywide referendum where not the city of Jacksonville, not an elite group of people, but average everyday citizens, the voters of Duval County will get to decide who they're, whether or not they want an elected superintendent. Yeah. And then if it passes, that won't take place until 2022, and then we'll have an election for an elected yeah. superintendent. What is the big priority for you when it comes to uh, getting into the session and getting into those 60 days? Because a lot of work is done before session even starts, right? Yeah, well, a lot of, a lot of work is done, and as you've seen from some of the bills that I filed, I'm already working on behalf of our constituents. So one of the bills that I filed is a communication services tax, CST. And if you have a cell phone, Kent, if you have Netflix, if you have Hulu, if you have Comcast or AT&T, you pay that tax. Everyday citizens um, pay that tax. And so what I'm trying to do is offer up tax relief for every citizen here in Florida. It's about a $250, a $250 million tax cut, but it would impact every citizen in Florida, everyone, uh, around the state would see a, a, a tax cut from it. One of the things I hope you'd explain was uh, the House Bill 4803, mm -hmm. and as I understand this is supports Holocaust survivors in Northeast Florida. I yeah. would imagine that a lot of people don't realize there are as many Holocaust survivors here in our region. Well, so the, the community I live in, in Jacksonville and Mandarin, we have a lot of, of um, Jewish Americans that live here. Well, it turns out when we went and looked at it, there's 104 Holocaust survivors here in the region. And, and I actually just got back on a trip from Israel and I visited Yad Vashem, which is a museum in Israel dedicated to the Holocaust victims. Um, and I thought to myself, what can I do to help people in my community who are affected here. And that's what we found out, 104 of them. Uh, most of them live at or below the federal well, poverty line. That would be the question is, why do they need help? Well, yeah. tell us more about that, yeah. Yeah, so so, so uh, great point. Most of them are at or, or below the poverty line when it comes to, to income. A lot of them suffer from PTSD. And, and uh, because of the age, dementia is starting to set in for a few of them. And my thought is, is they've suffered through some of the worst atrocities in yeah. human history. We have an obligation to, to help folks like that. And so, you know, they're having trouble aging in place. There's a lot of support services for different groups. Uh, we've got 104 of those survivors here in, here in our region. And I think we should, we should do everything we can to help them out. And that's, that's what I filed that bill to do. Appreciate getting to speak with State Rep Fisher. Other lawmakers uh, joining us soon include Senator Audrey Gibson and House members Travis Cummings and Tracy Davis. So this week in Jacksonville airs each Sunday morning at this time. Next Sunday, Congressman Jason Altmaier is with us again. We're going to talk about the push in Florida and really across America to open primaries to every voter. I'm Kent Justice. Thanks for watching on air on Channel 4 and the CW17 and online at news4jax.com. More people in Northeast Florida and South Georgia get their news from News 4 Jax than anywhere else.